Welcome to K9 Revolution Radio. Presented by K9 Revolution Dog Training, enhancing the dog and owner relationship through education, balance, and pack instinct. All right, everybody, welcome back to another episode of K9 oh, Revolution we're Radio. <laughs> Today we're talking about separation anxiety. Chris, welcome. Thank you. Kevin, welcome. Thank you. Ben, behind the camera, welcome. Always welcome. Good to go. <laughs> All right, so today we're talking about separation anxiety. Actually, this topic came from a leftover question from our recent Q&A episode, and I did not receive the question until after we had already shot the Q&A episode, but I was like, you know, that's such a good topic. I can't believe we haven't talked about it before. So here we are. So that person well, gets their own episode. Anxiety, just not right. particular Specific separation. separation anxiety. Yeah. So today we're going to be talking about I it. get separation anxiety when I, every time I have to go home, get away from you guys. Yeah, we know. So we're going to peel. Down Kelly told me you're chewing at the uh, chewing away at the uh, the baseboards. <laughs> you're chewing yep. the baseboards. I pee in the house, too. Digging holes in the yard, Excessively too. Like, like, <laughs> we have an off damn Digging like holes in the yard. <laughs> you digging I holes am in digging the yard? Ho- I am digging holes in the yard. All right. Productively, though. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, you know. Some of them, some of them maybe not. So productive. Chad's were productive. <laughs> Internet's back at least. Good to go. Yeah. All right. Today we're talking about separation anxiety in dogs. And we all know separation anxiety is pretty common today, unfortunately. You know, and a lot of this is due to some of the things that we are doing as dog owners we don't even know we're doing. So hopefully today's discussion is going to help us identify some of those problems and also give us some ways to... Uh, to work on these separation anxiety issues. You may right? not even know that it is separation anxiety. You may not even know. We're going to talk about it. But we do know that it's uh, unhealthy for your dog to have separation anxiety. You know what I'm saying? We also know that it can uh, create a lot of stress for you if your dog's suffering from this behavioral trait, separation anxiety. And it can also be costly to you. Because mm-hmm. some dogs, when they have separation anxiety, they act out. They cause damage to your home. They can cause damage to themselves, you know, resulting in a very large vet bill or an emergency vet visit. Need a $1,500 anxiety crate. (laughs) (laughs) Paying for consistent anxiety medications. Yep. Just putting a Band-Aid on it. All the above. So, in order to resolve separation anxiety, first we're going to look at uh, what it is, understand what it is, where it's coming from, peel away the onion layers, as Kevin already said. There it is. And, uh, we're going to... We're also going to take a look at where it could develop in a dog's lifetime and how we as the owner could be inadvertently reinforcing it, which is causing the behavior to stick around or also could uh, continue development of the behavior, right? So we're going to take a look at all that today. So basically what separation anxiety is, is it is an over-attachment to family members, usually a single family member, which results in an excessively anxious state of mind when separated from the primary caregiver, right? There can be different levels to separation anxiety as well. You could have a low-level dog experiencing separation anxiety, and that dog could display, uh, you know, behaviors such as barking, howling, pacing, drooling, whining, uh-huh. <laughs> or other similar behaviors when the owner is not present, right? So we've all seen this. Those of you listening, you listeners out there, first of all, we appreciate your support, mm-hmm. but you may have seen this in a dog as well, the barking, the howling, the pacing, the drooling, the whining, other things like that. Some dogs are even just like pee in the house, poop in the house, legit resulting from separation anxiety, right? Uh, but a high-level case of separation anxiety might include other behaviors, such as self-inflicting damage, excessively chewing themselves, like that one dog that uh, was one of Chris's first consultations. I'm not going to say the dog's name. We yeah. all know who it is, one of Chris's, because he always tells the story. Yeah. This dog's like chewing the crap out of himself. Hair's going everywhere. Spinning around. Spinning around. Slinging stuff all over the walls. Just drooling everywhere. Right? So that type of stuff. Going potty in the house, peeing, pooping. Chewing up items in the house. Other similar things. Right? We've all walked in that house for a consultation, and we've seen the baseboards tore up. We've seen the windows chewed up, you know, the blinds chewed up, you know, the doors chewed, all this stuff. Carpet, Carpet stairs. Carpet chewed up. 
Yep, all that kind of stuff. And then another level of separation anxiety, in an extreme case, could be legit destroying household items, chewing up at the doors, chewing up at the windows, chewing and eating things in the house, which is definitely not good because now you're talking about uh, issues, you know what I'm saying, in the, like if the dog eats something, like uh, we Kevin trained a dog that ate a Bible one time. Remember that story? <laughs> Almost killed the dog, you know, because of blockage. Yeah. Right? Uh, and scared the owner. And scared the owner. She was uh, worried he might have had a little little devil in him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, he ate the Bible. He's fine. He's yeah. good now. Uh, let's see. Scratching at the floor, scratching at doors, scratching at windows, breaking out of kennels, you know, stuff like that. Even a high-level case of separation anxiety, the dog's probably going to be busting out of that kennel or trying to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know how many dogs we've worked with that were working to rehab that kennel conditioning. Oh, yeah. That same dog we're talking about with the Bible, you know. That dog had to be reconditioned to a kennel. We had a couple other dogs, you know. That one dog Kevin took in an emergency spot. You know what I'm talking oh, about, yeah. Kevin? Oh, that yeah. dog. Yep. So that happens. But understand that in most cases – Dogs with separation anxiety, they are going to start out at a low level, right? And then as time goes on, if we don't identify and resolve the behavior and we allow it to continue or maybe we actually inadvertently reinforce the behavior, the dog's going to increase to a high level or an extreme level, right? And so what we need to do is make sure that we note and understand what we're seeing. If we have a dog that's doing any of the behaviors that we just talked about, you know what I'm saying, we can identify there might be some separation anxiety issues here. And, you know, and later on in this discussion, we're going to talk about what you can do to overcome that. You know what I'm saying? But it, it is important to identify it so we can get to the root cause and then begin to address that. You know what I'm saying? It's also important to note that separation anxiety may not uh, – just be to a person it might be to another dog mm -hmm. so how many dogs do we work with when there's two dogs in the house one of them is just crazy separation anxiety you know what i'm saying but as soon as it gets away from that other dog now that dog is just you know extreme level separation anxiety because it's away from its pack member that it's never used to being away from right you know what i'm saying um so anyway you guys have anything to add so far top topic talking points nothing so yeah, far that's a, uh, that's a good start good to go all right. So from the dog's point of view, what we're going to be doing is we're going to put ourselves in the dog's shoes, the dog's paws, and try to understand where the separation anxiety could arise from, where it could unfold in in the dog's life. Right. All right. So let's talk about, first of all, a puppy. Let's say we pick up a puppy from a breeder. Let's think about in the dog's perspective what it's done up to this point in its life. It's been with its mother. It's been with its litter mates. Hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yep. We're talking about a puppy from a breeder. So like a legit. A legit. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. gotcha. We're not talking about a dog that was picked up on the side of the road as a puppy, you know, or something like that. We're talking about a puppy from a breeder because there are a lot of, you know, this is a situation for a lot of people. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So uh, picked up the puppy from the breeder. The dog, from their perspective, the puppy is used to living with its mother and its litter mates at a minimum. A lot of times, if it's a really good breeder, they're going to be involved with the puppies every single day, doing different things with that puppy. Basically, this puppy is never used to being alone. Mm -hmm. Boom, right out the gate. So when we bring the puppy home, we try and do the right thing. We have the puppy sleep in a kennel in our room. However, the puppy is screaming. It's making a ton of noise. We feel bad. <laughs> so we let this puppy out, and it sleeps with us. Mm. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> already off on the wrong foot <laughs> a little side little side story here my personal my personal life this was before i was a dog trainer all right uh bane this was yesterday bane <laughs> whenever he was a puppy right we live me and lauren lived in a uh, studio apartment so not a lot of room mm -hmm. had bane in like the dining area in a kennel put him in his kennel for the night this dude starts freaking out screaming <laughs> So what do I do? I lay on the floor outside the kennel, hugging the kennel. Because I was like, he's got to be in a kennel. You know what I'm saying? I'm hugging the kennel, and I'm just singing to him. <laughs> wow. Wow. What was the Woo. song? If you can relate to that if you can relate to that story. I think it was Night Night Rough Rough. Night Night Go to Sleep. If anybody awesome. listening can relate to that story, you need to call us. ASAP. If you can relate to that story, drop us a comment below. 
<laughs> it wasn't that era. It was Guy on a Buffalo. Guy, Guy on a Buffalo. Buffalo. Good song. <laughs> we need to bring that song back. <laughs> oh, Lord. All right, so that's a little side side story there. But let's say we got the puppy in our in our room in a kennel. It's screaming, so we let it out. It's sleeping in the bed with us. Now, now it's just going to be in the bed, period, you know. As time goes on, the puppy spends the majority of its day with us. It's following us around. It's playing with us. It's walking with us, you know, all that type of stuff. Everything the puppy does, we are involved in. And everything we do, the puppy is involved in, right? I got my new cute puppy, <laughs> right? All the puppy knows in life is us and being with us. Life continues to go on. Let's say we go out to eat one day with some friends, and uh, we do it for a couple times, but each time we come home, we notice our dog has been drooling, but we don't think much about it, right? Why are you drooling? It's just a bulldog or whatever, you know? It's drooling. Just what they do. Next time we go out, we leave the dog, we leave the puppy. We can hear them howling and barking inside as we leave. Hmm, they're missing me, you know? Time goes on. We continue to go places. We have to leave. We leave our dog home. We have to go places. But over time, we notice small changes. We don't think about it too much until one day we get home and our dog has chewed our door frame. Now we are angry. How dare you chew the door frame? Right? Mm-hmm. No more good that, night was that, too loud, that was too loud. That was too loud. <laughs> he intense. turned you down. Ben's yeah. going to have hearing impairment because of this job. Yeah. <laughs> And we seek, and now the dog has chewed our door frame. Now we seek help from a professional dog trainer because we're trying to understand why our dog's chewing the door frame, and we're angry that it chewed the door frame. You've never done this before, right? They're mad at me. All right, so the key to this scenario is that when our dog was a puppy, we spent every waking moment with the puppy. To us as a human, this makes us feel good because the puppy's always with us. But we do need to have the future in mind and understand that this could result in separation issues as the dog begins to mature. Right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, guys? Oh, yeah. You guys got any input on that? Yeah, I can. I mean, I can vouch for it. So, like, when I first became a trainer, you know, and I was starting to work through everything with Vader. Oh, you know, hey, part of of the. uh, (laughs) Vader's got some good noises when Chris first started. Part of the perks of being a dog trainer, you can pretty much bring your dog to work any day you want. And so I started bringing him to work every single day. You better be training your dog, though. Well, uh, I mean, in between cuddle sessions, I was training him. (laughs) Only for reward. Only for (laughs) Only for rewards. Yeah. But, I mean, I'm bringing him with me to work every single day, spending a lot of time with him. And then the time comes where you got to do something like, I got an appointment, I can't bring my dog with me, that kind of stuff. And then I have to start leaving him at home or Mm -hmm. whatever. And I'm experiencing a lot of, and mostly with him, it's just moaning and whining, Mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. But he started to get separation anxiety because our bond was getting stronger and I was just spending so much time with him and not having healthy separations. Mm -hmm. So this is something I can definitely vouch for. He wasn't a puppy, but Mm -hmm. it's good to mix in those, you know, there's nothing wrong with having a strong bond, but ultimately you want them to be able to be independent and be perfectly fine. Exactly. That's got to be balanced. So we got to be cognizant of like our schedule, you know, Mm -hmm. what we're doing day to day, especially nowadays, you know, with the quarantine and everything that's happened, Mm -hmm. people have been at home with their dogs. Yeah. Good point. We need to implement some of those healthy separations. Hey, maybe, maybe he goes in his kennel for 30 minutes in the next room without you and just has like a little, you know, chill out session, you know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you can't walk to your room without your dog whining, you're, you're yeah. starting to experience some separation anxiety, and the earlier that you can catch it and address it, the better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or if you can't walk into, uh, or if you can't walk into another room because, you know, uh, your dog's following you, right. or you feel bad for leaving your dog. That's also don't forget that your dog's feeding off of you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you feel some sort of separation issue with your dog, right? Yeah. Your dog is just going to reflect that to you even stronger oh yeah it's hard it's hard not it's to hard. be a human yeah it's hard you gotta, not to be you gotta a human. hold yourself kind of back a little bit you gotta take a step back and look at it yeah again you know all these things we we really hammer home from the dog's perspective mm-hmm. you know what mm-hmm. i mean right so we just got to take a step back and kind of look at it from there to see what we're actually doing yeah exactly all right so let's look at another scenario all right you guys ready for this one bring it on we talked about a puppy from a breeder let's talk about an older dog that uh came from a rescue or a shelter Right. Let's say we go to the rescue or the shelter. We're looking at dogs. We pick out a dog. Nobody knows the history of the dog or where it came from. It showed up at the rescue one day. Maybe someone picked it up at the side of the road. We don't know. We adopt the dog and notice that it seems a little unsure. And now we're going to assume that someone in the dog's past has mistreated it 
because it's showing some unsurety. That's the first go-to. That's the first go-to. It's been abused. Yep. I think that just to fulfill that human need to it is. nurture yeah. it and is. You know, take care of and all yep. that. And you know what I say, you know, like, sure, there could have been things that have gone wrong in the dog's past, but we start that dog off just like anything else, right. boom, right out the gate. Mm-hmm. Start it off through our training progression. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Develop all the relationships and everything. That dog could be insecure for a variety of reasons. Don't assume that it's because it was mistreated in its past. Right. That's a critical mistake that a lot of people make. You know what I'm saying? And like you already said, it's because of that human right. emotion we want. We want, want that. We want them to have that past so that we can, you know, somehow save them from it or something well, like well that. Well, that and it's self-fulfilling. You yeah. Know, self-fulfilling. You want to tell your friends, this dog was abused. Now yeah, li- yeah, they live with yeah. me. It's such a great home, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> yeah. So, again, that's just being human. Yeah. Well, yeah and, then, and, and you're going now. You're going to go out of the way to take steps to make sure we don't have human contact. And now we're missing out on some social, important socialization right. stuff because, like, well, they don't like people because they were abused or we're assuming they were abused. And so we're going to keep them away from people, all that kind of stuff. And now now we're just start, this stuff's going to start to compound. Let's mm-hmm. we'll start giving them luxury meals, yeah. whole nine yards. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hall's Chop Kevin House. Those luxury meals. Oh, Hall's Chop House. Kevin Hall's walks into Hall's go. Chop House next in. They already got a table. Hey, Kevin, we got you. The got usual. His, they got his uh, order ready for him. They're yeah. probably like, oh, let's do it again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, Fuji. Same thing. Kevin walks Fuji. In. Okay, they, they do know me at Fuji. Uh-huh. Yeah. I actually have a chair at Fuji. Yeah, they got a yeah. chair for Kevin. <laughs> Kevin's name's on. He never invites us though. Never invite. I've never gotten an invite from Kevin no. to go to Fuji. Never. It's crazy. Mm. <laughs> no, no, that's true. That's true. Chris doesn't. Either. I didn't invite Ben to my birthday that I didn't have, so he's upset. <laughs> I'm still waiting to go to Denny's in St. George. <laughs> oh my God! All right, back on track, boys. Back on uh, track. Here we go. All right, so we adopt a dog. We notice it seems unsure, so we assume someone in the dog's past has mistreated it because of this unsureness. So now we pamper the dog, like we talked about. We give the dog everything we think. It wants, keyword we think, right? The best foods, that Hall's Chop House steak. Kevin goes to Hall's for this dog. He gets it a, a freaking $100 steak, brings it for the dog. The That's best a cheap toys. steak at Hall's. That's a cheap steak? Yeah. $99, 16 ounce dry aged tomahawk. Okay, he, he, knows knows the <laughs> he knows the order. No, I know. I ordered it once. I was like, wow, that was really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> we give the dog the best foods, the best toys. The dog goes to work with us. It follows us everywhere. One day, we decide to take a shower. We close the bathroom door with the dog outside the bathroom. How dare you? How <laughs> dare you? Then after the shower, we walk out. We notice the dog is panting heavily and pacing right there at the door. And you know what we think as a human? We feel bad. Time to come. We kneel down. We hug the dog. Boom. We say, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to leave you out here. Reinforce. Reinforce. Right? So now we're inadvertently. We don't know what we're doing. We're, we're treating it like a human. We're inadvertently reinforcing that separation anxiety, right? Time goes on. We go to the store one day. We leave the dog home. We come back. The dog has peed in the house. We think this is strange, but we clean it up. One day we decide to go visit a distant friend, and we can't take our dog with us. So we arrange for a friend to stay at our house with our dog while we are away. While we are gone, our dog refuses to eat, won't drink any water, begins to chew the fur out of its legs and tail, resulting in bleeding and also the dog destroys many items inside the house while the pet sitter has to go to work during the day we come home from our trip we are highly stressed out and we think i'm so sorry i can never leave you again right so a little bit different than the puppy scenario right this is an older dog but the separation anxiety is still there and over time it has progressed right it has progressed So, in both of these scenarios, we inadvertently create and reinforce the separation anxiety, the separation anxiety ourselves. In both scenarios we just discussed, we have inadvertently, right? We did not do this on purpose. We didn't really understand, right? As the owner, we inadvertently created and reinforced the separation anxiety. And this occurs frequently because we subconsciously treat the dog like they are a human And we simply don't have enough experience to understand their canine communication style or what they need as a dog. And that's where we come in. Canine Revolution. Here to save the day. 
right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys have any input on uh, that story or anything up to this point that we're talking about? Separation anxiety? Mm, no. Good. No? Good to go? Comfort wow. the human aspect. Wow. Good to <laughs> you, go. I mean, I mean you're, you're thorough. You're thorough, <laughs> man. You're, you're uh, not leaving us any room uh, here. Expert you're interactive style. Yeah. <laughs> we talked about in one of the other podcasts. All right. So now that we've identified a couple scenarios, we've identified that, hey, for the most part, separation anxiety, we as the owner are inadvertently, you know, reinforcing it. We're not helping resolve it. We're inadvertently reinforcing it. Now let's look at some ways that we can resolve this unhealthy behavior and ensure the best life possible. Turn it down. Turn it down. For both our dog and for us. Sorry. I get yeah, his headphones off that time. I so get a little amped up. <laughs> if you as a listener, if you have not noticed by it now, sometimes I get amped up. I'm a little bit passionate. We about call it passion. Exactly. I'm a little bit passionate about this stuff. All right. So let's look at some ways we can resolve this. Number one, ensure that we provide a balanced lifestyle each day that will fulfill our dog's basic instinctual needs of mental and physical exercise. Boom. Talk about this all the time, right? Our dogs need to balance out their energy daily, both physical and mental energy, right? We all have it. So do our dogs. The worst thing we can do, wake up, take our dog out to potty, leave it in the house. We go to work all day. We come back. I'm tired. I don't feel like walking, right? Our dog remains in the house. We let it out to go potty. Maybe we toss the ball like three times, you know, bring the dog back in the house. If that. It's horrible. Not good. <laughs> Sedentary lifestyle. Sedentary lifestyle. So, some things that we can do to help uh, achieve this mental and physical exercise with our dogs. Number one, obedience training. This can help to achieve our our dog's mental uh, exercise while walking or running or like structured play. You know, these are things that are going to resolve that physical exercise. So, two walks per day that are about 20 to 30 minutes each should be plenty of uh, ex physical exercise for your dog, I would say at a minimum, you know what I'm saying? Um, but if you have time and are able to do more and you want to do more, obviously do it. Don't yeah. limit yourself to just two 20 minute walks. And we all know there's dogs out there that this is not going to satisfy that physical exercise need. Mm -hmm. We work with dogs that have very excessive energy levels every single day. These dogs need more stimulation than the average dog. And generally this type of dog is going to be like a working breed you know like a malinois or a doberman or something like that you know german shepherds and uh you know the owners are extremely busy they got this high drive working dog and that's when it becomes a little bit troublesome you know because you got to satisfy that physical and mental exercise need that the dog has you know but the first step you can do is to provide a balanced lifestyle make sure that you're fulfilling mental and physical exercise guys we got. Yeah, I mean, I think you can add in there. That's where we we are always talking about the routines and rituals. Routines right? and rituals. I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> I mean, routines that's what I'm. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, I had that saved actually in there to bring up. Oh, so, yeah. but yeah, yeah, I mean, you make this part of those routines and rituals. This alone is what's going to help with that anxiety. They have things that they can count on, so they know. Okay, that walk is coming at this yeah. time, and you know, we're getting fed at this time. This is my ritual. This is my routine, mm -hmm. and that's going to help them with that anxiety long term anyway yeah. so build the confidence they know what's coming bingo you know? and even if you have old dogs like we talk about adopting like an old dog from a shelter you know mm -hmm. say i adopt like a i don't know like an 11 year old german shepherd from the shelter mm -hmm. you know you can still achieve physical mental stimulation right no one's telling you you have to go walk like you know six miles after work like you got like a high drive doberman or something yeah, yeah. Uh, but you can still you know go out low impact stuff you know get them working get them moving motion's lotion you know motion, motion is lotion keep going so yeah. yep exactly all right, so number two, which you guys already talked about a little bit, is incorporating healthy separation into your routine and rituals, right? Um, uh, if you get a puppy, you want to start this pretty much as soon as possible when they're young. If you adopt an older dog, again, start as soon as possible. Healthy separation could be sometime in the kennel in a separate room or a separate area of the house, or you could use a pet cot or a dog bed in the same fashion. You know, send them over to that pet cot dog bed, have them remain there while you move around or exit that area of the house, and they should remain there, you know? And both of these ways allow your dog to observe what's going on throughout the house 
and also and your dog also understands that they are not always going to be involved or always right next to you so this has to be something that you are very conscious of because a lot of people our our basic human instinct is that we want our dog with us right and a lot of people when i'm talking to them about this like let's say i'm taking the dog home i'm talking to them about this healthy separation and you know they hear one of my recommendations keep your dog in a spot or downstay for the first three weeks or so you know they want to take their dog with them to each room and have them do a downstay at that room which is cool sometimes but sometimes you deliberately consciously have to position them away from you Mm -hmm. and you go somewhere else to achieve that healthy separation you know what i'm saying like you already talked about kevin with the covid stuff a lot of people are working from home now so it's harder to achieve healthy separation you have to be conscious about it yeah deliberate deliberate about it and when we start going back to normal like we already have you know there may be some effects right right from the past year right. or now so. we're going to have some separation anxiety where it hasn't been there before yeah. possibly yeah you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. got to mow your grass go mow the grass dog stays in the kennel for a little bit yeah healthy separation good to go you gotta mow the grass you gotta mow the grass yeah mm. i was wondering why you had that on your mind yeah that's why i popped <laughs> in there well, gotta mow the grass <laughs> First, you got to finish your trenches. Yeah, I can't mow the grass right now. I'll fall in a trench. <laughs> I'm digging trenches at my property, FYI. <laughs> yeah, for the listener, we apologize. In our past <laughs> podcast episodes, we go off on these side tangents, and you have no idea where we're at. We're going to try to do better we're to explain better. We're going to detail what these side tangents are. <laughs> so Chris is currently French draining his property, and uh, it's a lot of trenches that he's digging right now. A lot of digging. A lot of his dirt. yard is destroyed. Yeah. What's a French drain? It moves water. It's a drain. It was a... Uh, French drain would be a in-ground water drainage system. Invented in France. Invented in by the French. Yeah. Maybe. Basically. <laughs> you want to know about French drains? Let me tell you real quick. Here we go. <laughs> All right. That's a separate episode. Basically, you're going to dig a trench into the ground with the proper slope to move the water via gravity. You're going to put some filter fabric into that slope. Then you're going to put your French drain pipe at the bottom of the filter fabric. Then you're going to put rock on top of that. Not pea gravel. But rock, at least three-quarter inch in size. Then you're going to wrap that in a burrito style with your filter fabric, staple it, and put grass on top. French drain. He makes it sound so easy. It's not. <laughs> All right, back to the podcast. All right. Back to the separation anxiety. So, you know, healthy separation, critical. Using a kennel, using a dog bed or a cot, both of these ways are going to allow your dog to observe what's going on, but also understand they're not always going to be right next to you all the time right this is critical because this ensures that separation anxiety is not set in and it also establishes routine boundaries and rules with your dog to ensure that the pack maintains a calm confident and relaxed mindset right Mm -hmm. so you brought up chris you know cutting your grass you know you could technically have your dog outside with you put him in a pet cot or a spot at a distance from you while you're cutting the grass yeah in a safe place right your dog, you like, let's say you got to go behind your house and your dog's out front. That's separate. Yeah, that's that healthy separation. I'm thinking about training flex right now when I had tried to get on the lawnmower. Oh, yeah. Drive around. Drive around, <laughs> make sure you didn't attack the lawnmower. Nice. You didn't attack it, boys. That, that was one of go. those things. You'd attack the lawnmower. <laughs> Good dog. All right. <clears throat> a lot to learn with that dog, huh, Kevin? Oh, man. I'm night and day. I came out a different trainer. <laughs> All right, so healthy separation, you have to incorporate it in your routine throughout your dog's entire life. This is critical, you know. All right, next, number three, don't make coming and going a big deal. Mm, that's hard. That's Walk hard in. For a lot of people. Oh, yeah. I've been at work all day. Oh, Easier said than done, man. <laughs> hard for hard Dogs for jumping, people. going crazy. You're petting oh, yeah. them. I love you, man. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> They're oh, always yeah. happy to see you. <clears throat> They're always going to be happy. So... You know, whenever you leave your house, if you just make it a big party, start celebrating, <laughs> hugging your dog, going crazy with him, then you walk out. You know, you just had this big party. Now you're gone. Holy shit. Dog's just jacked you know? up now. Like, what? Dog's yeah. jacked up. You now just gave him this wonderful, heck? pleasurable experience and then followed it with like eight hours of trauma. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you know? And then you return home and all of a sudden you walk in the door, big party again. And to them, you've been gone for years. Yeah, to them, you've just been, <laughs> holy shit, he's back. You know? So in this case, you know. You got to make coming and going not a big deal. So the way you're going to do that is we call it the 15 minute rule, but basically 15 minutes before you leave, you're either going to put your dog in a kennel, say your goodbyes then, put your dog in a kennel, still be in the house for 15 minutes, then you leave, or 
you know, you, if your dog's not using a kennel, you're just going to 15 minutes, you're going to say your goodbyes and then pretty much act like your dog's not there. No matter what they're doing, they're just walking around, whatever, you know what I'm saying? Then you just walk out the door whenever it's time to go. <clears throat> Same thing. When you come back home, you come back home. If your dog's in the kennel, you ignore them for 15 minutes, no talk, no touch, no eye contact. When 15 minutes is up, or if they're super calm, then you can walk over, let them out, that kind of thing. Uh, or if your dog's just kind of free, free roamer in the house, you walk in the door, they're going to be super excited that you're there, but do not be tempted. No talk, no touch, no eye contact for 15 minutes. That way your dog can calm down and coming and going cannot be a big deal, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that's super hard. You know what I'm saying? But it's super important, right? Um, and by doing so, this is, again, going to help maintain the proper balance of energy and mindset in your dog and in you, too. Because like we already talked about, a lot of the cases of separation anxiety is due to us feelings, you know, we're, we're separating from our dog. We're like, oh, my gosh, I have to leave you. I feel bad. You know, that kind of thing that just makes that separation anxiety even stronger from our dog. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You guys got anything to add? Yeah, I mean, bottom line, like you don't have to feel bad if you're doing everything you need to be, be doing outside of this stuff. You know right. I'm Like you're giving them the mental, physical stimulation. Like I, I feel there's no issues when I'm leaving my dogs because I know I'm doing what I need to as a responsible dog owner. Right. Uh, so there's no, like I'm not just sitting here right now thinking, oh my gosh, what are my dogs doing? They miss me right now. I yeah. miss them. Yeah. You know what I mean? I know I've, I've worked them, got their work in this morning, going to get some work in afterwards, that kind of stuff. Um, and then you'll, you'll notice you make this part of your routines and rituals, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. your dogs will, will start to like that 15 minute window will start to kind of shrink a little bit. Like yep. for my dogs, it's usually 60 seconds. They're free roaming. I come home from work. Of course, they're a little anxious to see me. I don't even, I don't, I don't cross the threshold of my door. My door's cracked. I see boop, 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 three noses popping. They're whoop, 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 getting excited. I say, go spot. They go to their spots. I walk in. From there, I, I ignore them. And usually within 60 seconds, they're nice and calm. Right. Nice, calm, relaxed. And then I'm not reinforcing any any bad mindsets or anxiety, things like that. So hold to this stuff, and that's what's really going to treat it. You know, yeah. That's the thing, too. Be aware of the mindset. Yeah. Right? So if you're say you're battling something like, you know, you don't like your dog jumping on people. Well, when you come home and your dog's amped oh up jumping gosh. on you and you're Bingo. petting them and loving on them, you're just encouraging that behavior. Bingo, yeah. So yeah. they're not going to re be able to really know the difference between, oh, it's okay to do it when you come home, but not okay to do it now. At least not without some, like, serious work. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's better just to interact with your dogs when they are nice and calm, especially if you're dealing with things like this, insecurity, anything, to mm -hmm. help overcome and rehabilitate those mindsets. Yeah. And like Chris already talked about, you know, if, uh, if you feel bad because your dog's at home, you know, while you're at work or you feel bad because you weren't able to take your dog out, you know, because you're out hanging out with friends or something like that. The way to not feel bad is by fulfilling those basic needs, right. making sure that you get in mental and physical work with your dog before you leave for the day. And then whenever you get home again, fulfilling mental and physical needs at a minimum, what we talked about. You Maybe if you, if you, if you have that feeling where you're feeling bad, that search not doing search it. a little deeper. There's something else going on inside. You're and not you doing know what? You know what? You know what? What? <laughs> Sometimes, <laughs> you know what? Sometimes you may have to wake up early. What? Whoa. Ooh, you may have <laughs> Holy cow. You <laughs> may have to wake up early. I don't have time to make sure that you can fulfill I don't have time in the day to, to make work sure my that dog. you can fulfill your daily mental and instinctual needs. Quick story. Quick story for you guys. I don't oh think boy. I told you. Someone texted me the other day. They said they're running out of time. They're running out of time in the day. They wake up at 5.40 a.m. That's lunchtime. They're, they're running out of time in the day because they wake up at 5.40. They have to hurry up and go to work. You know what I told them? You want to know what I told them? I, do, I, I, I probably know what you <laughs> told I told them I wake up at 3.40 a.m. So I can make sure I get enough time in. We had an hour of trench digging done by 5.40. 5.40, we were already done with digging trenches for yeah. an hour yeah easy <laughs> <laughs> easy day Let me just and then take what you said turn then around we, then we went to lunch <laughs> then we went to lunch went to lunch it was no breakfast. no no breakfast no no no. we ate dirt for breakfast <laughs> from the trenches that's true that is true back on track here though <laughs> you might have to wake up early earlier than you used to waking up to make sure that you can fulfill those needs and that's so hard for me it's hard sometimes for me i have to get up at 3 40 because, number one, 
I like to work out. I like to go to the gym unless I'm digging some trenches. That's right? kind of like a gym. It it is. Is. That's a full body. It is. So I like to work out. <coughs> if you want to see that workout, you can check out our YouTube video, Day in the Life. I'll show you one of my workouts, chest workout. Uh, when are we posting that, by the way? Posting that within a week. So this podcast will come out after it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, check out that video if you want to see some workouts. But, you know, me, that helps me with my physical energy and my mental energy, too, personally. Mm -hmm. But then I have to go home, you know, got to take care of my kids, you know, got to make sure I fill my dog's mental and physical energy as well. So for me, I just have to identify I got to get up at 3.40 a.m. when most people wake up to take a piss and they're like, I get three more hours of sleep. That's me. You know, <laughs> I'm waking so, up I'm a to get guy. up after it, to get up, get after it, you know. But I, I just use that as an example. Obviously, that's kind of extreme for most people, but I use that as an example because I didn't always get up at 3.40. I used to hate waking up early. Over time, I woke up at 6 a.m., then 5 a.m., then 4 a.m., trying to make sure I could get all these things done now. Eventually, he's just not going to sleep. Oh, Eventually, no. it's going to be 2 a.m. I've been getting earlier and earlier. I yeah. think this is happening it now. Happens. That's <laughs> what happens. <laughs> yeah. Hey, yeah. I'll do it. I'll do it. No, there will be no going to bed. Yeah. Just, I'm just up. If he didn't have to go to bed, he wouldn't. He's conditioning sleep out of his life. He bottom just, line. He lays down like a vampire in a coffin <laughs> and just goes to sleep. <laughs> he just sits up at 340. Bottom <laughs> line, make sure that you get that mental and physical exercise and to fulfill your dog's basic needs. Yeah. There's no excuse. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, maybe you're not Maybe you're not a morning person. I get it. But I mean, guess what? you got to stay up a little late then. Yeah. yeah. Get it in. You can get That's in. the thing. You you it's, it's all about You can get it you know, whenever you need to. Yeah. 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 You know, think back to when you were a kid and you found a stray dog on the road. Dad, can I keep it? Mm -hmm. This is a responsibility, son. Mm -hmm. With talk, great power. Talking about my own father here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> With power comes great responsibility. Dogs are a responsibility. You got to feed it. You got to walk it. You got to do. You know. So even then, we knew the bare bones basics. You mm -hmm. know. Yeah. So yep. you, some dogs, sure, you can you can probably have, and they're just good to go. They may be like lazier. They still need some they bare still bones need basic maintenance. You know, some level of it. They yep. still need it. You know. All right, off the tangent. <laughs> All right, but the three points we talked about. The three points were providing a balanced lifestyle each day that fulfills our dog's basic needs of mental and physical exercise, incorporating healthy separation in your routine and ritual, and then don't make coming and going a big deal. Those three points are the proper foundation for ensuring that we don't allow separation anxiety to be a part of our dog's behaviors, and it keeps our entire pack in good mentality, good energy state, right? And other, the other thing, too, is like walking your dog or hanging out with your dog that's going to satisfy some of your mental and physical needs as well. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Walking them, hanging out with them, teaching them something or maintaining your your obedience behaviors. That's working you mentally because, you know, you may have to help your dog through a certain situation or help teach them something new. Play some brain games with them. Play some know? tug. That'll work you physically. It's going to be physical, very physical. You know, Nice cardio session. Good cardio. But all right, so that's a good discussion on separation anxiety. Um, obviously, there's some other things, too, that could be considered. And obviously, there's some very, very extreme and special cases when it comes to separation anxiety. And we've dealt with them here, you know, very extreme cases. Um, so if you guys do have a question, drop it in the comments below. Reach out to us via email, text, messenger, whatever, you know, <laughs> let us know. Carrier um, pigeon. Nail. <laughs> but I do want to take a moment and thank all of our listeners. I just learned the other day that we have some dog trainers in Florida listening to our podcast. You know, nice. We got some feedback from. Aren't you going to Florida here shortly? Uh, you know, Might be taking a little vacation. Will. Against my will. Nice. Uh, but, you know, we had some people in Florida. We have some people in Michigan that are listening, providing feedback, California. So thank you, everybody, for taking the time to listen. Yeah, seriously. Let us know any uh, – let us know any uh, – subjects that you'd like us to discuss leave us comments on youtube if you're watching it on there on your favorite podcasting platform whether that be spotify apple podcast go ahead drop us a five star review let us know how we're doing five stars right give us some topics give us some comments good to go but we do appreciate you guys the listeners right and uh appreciate you guys too chris and kevin thanks for being here we appreciate you ben thanks for being here buddy good to go thanks for keeping us in line Ben makes the magic happen. Yep. All right. You guys have anything to wrap it up? 
No, it was good stuff. Good to go. Good. All right, guys. Y'all have a good one. Out. <laughs>